Check out this beauty. Wow. We're talking about a blast from the past of some way cool bikes back in the day. Suspension, that's what we're talking about here. You got the Gary Klein, got the faded paint job, got XTR componentry, Chris King headset, Fox shocks. Yeah, the only downer is it's not, well, I say it's not relevant, but it's still relevant to even off-road riding today. Yeah, you might be in your 29er or 27er, whatever kind of niche thing you're into, ride one of these bad boys and you'll fall in love right back in the 26ers, especially at this high level. Yeah, you Klein fanatics out there, you're gonna love this, just love it. Hey, let's start jumping right into this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles, hanging out with a guy. Hi, I'm Justin the Guy. Obviously I have a garage shop. Take scary out of used, one bike at a time. If you want to be kept up to date on latest projects and topics, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles, hanging with a guy. Hey, I'm Justin the Guy on this old bike series. Yes, this old bike is still relevant. I think, I don't know, maybe not, but hey, if you ride a bike and having a good time with a smile on your face, that makes a relevant bike, right? Well, any case, you know those old stories about, oh, how about you grab an old Porsche? It might be 10 or 15 years, 20 years old. Back in the day, Porsches were super expensive, but you can buy a Porsche fairly inexpensive. This is the Porsche of mountain bikes back in the day. Klein, we were a Klein dealer in the 90s in the Parker Bikes days. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And it's one of those situations where Trek acquired them and basically infused them with all sorts of money to come up with great innovations within the cycling spectrum. So that good 15, 10 years or so, probably not 15, but 10 years window that they were making clients, they came out with some really cool stuff. And it was really different than what Trek was making, which was nice because, you know, it's a different perspective. And also Gary Fisher, the other Gary. So the Gary Klein though, hey, he was an engineer for MIT, uh, came up with this granular tube process, process through a grant, basically molding, you know, using different alloy blends, what have you, to come up with a super high-end alloy. And then they integrated carbon on the actually chain stays on this one. Internal cable routing. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, K grade or head tube. The head tube is flared out. So all features each individual of these items that were unique to Klein's uh, making or manufacturing under the truck umbrella. And this is oh, XTR componentry nine. Probably late, uh, late to early two, late nineties, early two thousands is probably this bad boy here. But hey, honestly, if you're doing light trail riding and what have you, yes, a 29er, those are fun. They have their thing, but 26ers, they still have some relevance to them, and they're just fun to ride. So if you're going to add another kind of uh, bike to your stable for just funness, um, I've actually sold a few of these used by refurbishing and the people like ride them and love them. They're just kind of fun. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I'm gonna have to take this bike apart, clean it. It has it had some good use and kind of evaluate, is it still relevant to fix up and get it as incomplete? Or is this one of those bikes where the costs are gonna outweigh and gonna to have to part it out? give somebody an opportunity for you know if the frames damage well that's just a box of parts if uh, some of the parts are too ex expensive to replace that's another issue too so i gotta weigh those out when you're refurbishing bikes so that's basically we're going to kind of focus on this gym here because at the end of the day regardless if i do come across a boo-boo situation where i just can't go any further because it either costs too much or the frame is compromised well, I'm probably gonna make what I have into it through the parts that are still fresh and relevant and still work uh, today. So there is a huge uh, parts 
lists out there on eBay and so forth, uh, bike lists that do sell these used refurbished parts. So if you come across a bike like this and you need a shifter or a brake or a crank set, you can still find those parts out there. Um, I refurbish some of them and send them out because they're just extra by, uh, for the byproduct of what I do. And hey, you know, this is one of those bikes, if I can get it to be in complete, uh, completed form with pretty much original specs, <laughs> this is this is one of those bikes if I can clean up the frame and everything else to almost original state condition it's almost museum quality type bike but in any case let's start diving into this so when you drop any wheel you want to throw it in the small gear on this one's a rapid fire trigger shifter drop down to the small as your quick release, this is way before through axles. Uh, way be well, it's right in the era where they're actually doing discs. We'll talk about that in a second. But this one has actually um, brake V brake posts for the linear pull brake system. So you pull that open so the wheel can drop out. But let me show you something kind of cool. So this particular bike, they have this little notch here. Um, this was a prioritary to Trek design, and you see a little bolt hole. <laughs> oh, that's weird. Um, there's a little bracket and I believe you can still get, find them on like eBay or what have you that actually is a disc rotor mount adapter. This was common on for uh, three years, maybe four, and they had them on their whole line because the idea, this is when uh, disc brakes were becoming a thing. So they were able to make a lot of these frames disc brake adaptable. I uh, may have a model of this that may have been upper end where they use the same triangle, but they actually use the disc brake portion. This doesn't have a disc brake wheels, so if you're going to do that, you'd have to switch out the wheel set. Although the front uh, shock has brake, um, disc brake bolt mounts as well, the, the universal standard, so it wouldn't be too hard of a lift to switch this over to a disc brake system. But this does still have the standard quick release instead of the through, and if any luck, uh, this may drop out fairly in a easily. Nope. Nope. Huh. Oh, interesting. <laughs> this uh, skewer nut on this side is so freaking big, it won't slide over the derailleur. Ugh. There we go. That's a <laughs> fancy little thing, but problematic. Yeah, let's check this chain, see if it's even salvageable. Um, oh, wow, okay. It's actually still pretty good. Um, not even up to 0.5 yet, so we'll see if we can get that chain to come alive in the ultrasonic cleaner. Found myself by PowerLink. Even this far back, they have a power link, quick links, all those kinds of fun things, so. Um, that just makes it easier to work on some of these older ones. And that's interesting. It's kind of boogered up and won't come apart. There we go. Just maybe extra gunk on there. Kind of stiff feeling. So what they may have used on a lube, which feels still pretty dry. There's not much coming off on my glove. Um, yeah, we'll clean that up and see what we have. Oh, it's a PC971, which is a higher end SRAM chain, so that's a good thing. So yeah, we're gonna cut some cable ends here. They are pretty long, so if the cables are still good, maybe the housing might need to be replaced, but at the end of the day, I probably would reuse these. Um, see if they're compromised when I take them out of the shifter. This is the XTR rear derailleur. I have a video on one of these I completely took apart and cleaned. And uh, he knows that sleeve popped out. It's in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. <laughs> That's just a boot. The idea was to try to keep a lot of the contaminants out. Uh, so these usually press on pretty tight, but yeah, we'll have to deal with that later. And this, oh, there's an interesting one back here too. Oh, this one has the other little slide deal. So we may replace that. That's usually that piece is, you know, pretty compromised. So back to the derailleur. I don't see a cracked pulleys, but you know, at this stage, sometimes 
it's easier to scrape the skunk off the derailleur. That's uh, caked on Teflon. And just kind of put a trash can underneath where all that stuff, and this is some dry stuff. So this has been on there for a long time. It's like bouncing around on the floor. And I got some on this side too. Sometimes having it up here, it's a little bit easier to scrape that gunk off. Yeah, that's on there pretty good. May have to soften that up and do some more. But standard Allen. These uh, do have replaceable dropouts, which is nice. Although these are not the Klein rear entry dropouts, which were a few years before. They were still doing them on the road and maybe on their hardtails. I'd have to look up a catalog. But this still has all its little fancy bits, like the boot, the little boot here with the clip. The jockey pulleys look like they're still in pretty good shape. They still have some flat roundness to them. They're not spiky like shark teethed out. Um, a little bit of scarring, but nothing too bad. And it still has a little bit of life. So I think this derailleur will come back to life really well. Front derailleur here. This is, whoop, top pole. So the cable comes from the top. This is not a dual direction, so specific. These are pretty cool. Um, this looks like it's still in pretty good intact. Yeah, not too much rust, surface, all that. It should clean up really well. Make sure I don't lose track of my little bolt. So we'll throw that back in, in place. And if you're wondering, this is a top pole derailleur, which means the cable pulls it from the top versus the bottom pole. And if you're looking for size of the derailleur, a lot of the times they're stamped right on the inside here. So you can get the right diameter for the clamp. So this brake has also a boot on it, as well as that rear derailleur. That's kind of where they got the idea from. Just to try to keep the contaminants drawing up into the housing. Let me take that off there. I'll probably cut the cable and release that. And I'm gonna take these off here as well and put these in the ultrasonic cleaner. And keep mindful, there's three little pinholes on the inside here. You just, usually it's in the middle. You just wanna keep mindful when you take these apart and any other spacers. Uh, there should be some grease on there, which there's still some grease remainder. So actually, actually still pretty good. And the brake pad still has some meat on it. So it just needs to be kind of sanded down a little bit, uh, refresh that pad. These also are replaceable insert pads. So you can pull that little pin and it slides right out and slide a new one in, which is kind of a nice feature back in the day. And for the non-drive side or left side of the bike, same thing. Basically, try not to lose any bolts as you're doing that. For the crank set, I like to uh, get these pedals off first. I'm not sure if I'll use these ones. They're just a standard Welgo, which is not an upper end. Uh, some people will have their own preference to pedals, so uh, I will probably put a decent set of platforms on there. I may have some specialized ones. And it uh, looks, feels like they were just thrown on there. They were not on there for very tight, so. They were probably just put on for somebody to test ride or use recreationally. Uh, that means, that might be good news because that means maybe less use. All right, like on a lot of these crank sets back in the day, they have a self-extracting bolt where all you need to do is grab the Allen key, break it free, and it may draw out. Interesting enough, this does not have extra self-extracting bolt on the left side. It's uh, missing. So they just put a uh, spacer on there. I'll have to see if I can find one. But no threat, there's the tool. If you do the ISIS or the V2 style bonnet brackets from Shimano, there's a tool for these uh, Holotech design. The idea is these crank arms are hollow inside there. And you want to make sure you get that in there all the way so you're not pulling any threads out as you're using the tool. So get that in so it stops. And then this pin will push and apply pressure on the bottom bracket spindle to pull the crank arm off. 
can see it's pulling through a little bit there. Whoop. Like so. This one's not too bad. You still have the XR logoing on there, so that's a good sign. Things are still geed. Bummer about that cap though. Those are especially colored disc color, kind of hard to find. Oh, my tool fell apart. So on this side, I can definitely see that two pin self-extracting cap. So it shouldn't be too, too horrible to push these out. And it basically eliminates the need for the tool. All you need is an eight millimeter Allen to make sure you can extract that. You want to also make sure that cap is in all the way or flush because if it isn't, you'll have the same problem of pulling those parts out. But looking at the teeth, I mean, looking at those teeth, they're rounded, they have flat tops, the ramps are still intact, no, no shark teeth looking. So this is a good crank. As long as the chain rings are straight, we're good to go. And while we're here, we're going to check that bottom bracket and see how smooth it is. It actually feels really smooth, not grindy at all. This way I can get into all these nicks and crannies, but I am kind of concerned about this little area. See what kind of crustiness is going on here. See if I can be cleaned up and inspected, make sure there's no uh, damage to that. And look at the inside, it doesn't look too bad. That's the only really concerned part I've seen so far on this. And we'll see how that looks when I clean it up. And it feels sticky. I think they had a, um, a plate here to prevent chain scarring. I think that's just the paper or the material left from that, that plate for sticking on there for, for protection. I uh, may want to put something on there as well, like extra uh, protection or a wrap to protect that area once I get it all cleaned up. So the V-brakes on the front, same kind of concept, pull and open, and the skewer. These do have matching skewers, which is nice. A lot of times so they'll be mixed matched. These are the Bond Tracker Race Light Tubeless. What? So this is right when they started doing tubeless back in the day. It says right there. And also, which is crazy, is this is has kind of a ceramic siding. They did this for better breaking in bad contaminants. So you have to have specific ceramic brake pads to go with these ceramic rims. So FYI on that. And just looking to see if it says that on the rim. But the stickers still look like they're in pretty good, de decent condition. I think these are going to clean up really well as long as there's no dings. And you know, the mountain bike is a mountain bike, right? They get used off-road. Um, therefore, looking for damage is more probable on something like this than your standard road bike or recreational pavement bike because these get kind of abused. It's like buying a older Jeep that have been bashed around. And these look pretty straight. They, look, they don't look like they've had any major damage. Sometimes these guys get bent a little bit. Let me get that cable. They fold the cable inside so it doesn't stick out. And if it sticks out, what happens is it dangles. And when it dangles, it breaks and frays. So you want to tuck it in like they did as best as you can. And just like the rear, let's see if these still have any grease left over. Oh yeah, so definitely whoever assembled this did it proper, which is nice. The grease may be old, so this bike is probably has not been touched service-wise at least 10 years, if not more. You can tell how thick that grease is. That's going to take a little bit of elbow grease to clean it off. So there's a little bit of boo-boo scarring back here from the cable rubbing. So that's going to be a detailing thing. Keep in mind, this still is internal routing on both sides. You definitely don't want to drop those cables inside there. This is such a short area. It would be almost impossible to fish out. So you want to thread it with a sleeve in there when you take that cable out and, uh, and re replace it. And in this case, I will. And there's some zip ties to hold these things in place. So I'll be cutting into that as well. Interesting note is 
the cables cross over inside this little booger. So <laughs> the sleeves are gonna go. Yeah, I ain't gonna change that. <laughs> I'll just do what it was. Um, yeah, that's that's something. I have two short sleeves just for this purpose. This is what they look like. They're small enough diameter to go around the cable, but in through the actual cable stops. And therefore, we want to surgically insert these that I can re-thread the cables through when I'm ready. And also that pulls the cables out of the way. So when I'm detailing, um, it's actually not a booger. I can work around it. So this is going to come out the opposite side. And before I drop that cable, guess what? I'm going to take some tape and tape it down like that. And that way, it doesn't slide out. If that slides out, I'm in a world of hurt. Oh boy, like I said. Gotta be very mindful of this. All right, now for the other side, it's gonna feed through the opposite direction. These are derailleur cables, by the way. The brake cables housing was on the outside and it's one long piece. So this bike was anticipating of having disc brakes Sure that doesn't go anywhere. Then when I clean these areas, I'll be very careful of moving the tape around and making sure they don't slide out. So if those slide out, I am in a world of hurt and just not a small world of hurt. So there we go. That's pre-prepped. So I'm going to take this all off, pop these off, and uh, put these in the ultrasonic cleaner as well, which you can. And get all that gunk out of there. I mean, how many years of grease and gunks in there? There is hesitation in the shifters a little bit, so that will definitely help out clean those. And this gives me an opportunity to really get into the frame and inspect it and clean it. All right, let's dive into that. Well, it looks like we got the wheels cleaned up. I'll be truing those and inspecting. And look at the drivetrain bits. Yeah, they'll clean up, and the brakes are pretty decent. Those chain rings, this guy are just phenomenal. And we've got some really nice shifters. Those will work pretty well. But yeah, let's take a look at this frame and get a closer look what we need to do to it. <sighs> You're literally taking the scary out of used, one bike at a time. Yeah, looking at this bike, it's a 2002 Medium a Klein Adept Pro. Nicest full suspension that Klein had in 2002. You're talking about XTR componentry, ceramic rims, ceramic brake pads. Yeah, all the bells and whistles. This actually got upgraded to a Chris King headset in addition to that. All of it looks pretty good, except the frame. I started doing some cleaning on it, and I thought it was a little piece of paper on the drive side, but let's take a look at what this really is. And uh, let's see if you can tell me what it is. All right. Get my stand here. So this is on a drive side, right? And, you know, drive side sometimes gets a lot of scarring from chain suck, basically. Chain suck is a professional term when things suck and suck up. <laughs> but I thought this was paper. And I thought this was like that plate that they put on a lot of like uh, road bikes and mountain bikes for pre prevention of chain suck. And there's some scarring here. And I started flicking it. It's like a, it's not paper. And this piece came off. And lo and behold, how that piece was in there. Flick that off and it shows exposed carbon. This is a very crappy patch. I would assume, so diving into this more in depth, I mean, it's hard to like bondo. Somebody decided to bondo the frame and uh, open that up. So, and noticing the depth of the carbon here, 
And as the bondo flakes away, and bondo is a aesthetic patch for cars, but not good for mountain bikes. So, needless to say, ah, get this big piece off. It's definitely ground down several layers of the carbon. This is no good. This is not good. It's not a proper patch. It actually goes right up against the seam of where the metal meets. So to do a, an actual patch work here professionally with carbon, as you can hear the picking bounce. Oh man, that just goes. I mean, I don't think it went all the way through, but that is pretty pretty significant cut into the frame right there. So yeah, in my professional opinion, I do not feel safe selling this frame in this condition of what I would do if I was gonna repair this, I'd cut this section out, beef in a layer of actual carbon, rebondo that, but here's the thing, it's a mountain bike where it's on a road, depending where it was like a different spot, might be something less scary, but since this is right, ah, this is where the whole drivetrain linkage system is, this is just, mm, yeah, I, I can't let that go out in this condition. So another damn frame to hang on the wall or see when I do carbon patching, see if I can fix that too in the laundry list that I already have. But other than the case, I basically have a box of parts on this guy. Let's recap. Well, situations like this, you know, you gotta do the right thing. I mean, that's why I'm out and doing this. Some other yahoos out there, private party to sell to sell, they may not know that they've been there. Um, or they do and they just don't care and they just pawn it off to the next owner. Well, unfortunately this particular bad boy, uh, just not gonna, it's not gonna work. I mean, it's just, that is a fail rate where, you know, if it was me riding it, I wish it was my size, but if it was me riding it, maybe be okay. Uh, for me as a business person and being an advocate of cycling, and making sure the best safe possible for, you know, product I can produce out there. Yes, it's not it's not good. I mean, I ride a couple of bikes that are you know have a little bit of damage on them, but that's me. You know, if, if it fails or I keep an eye on it, I inspect it. I know what I'm looking at, right? Um, for individual that's just into cycling, avid cyclists, they may not know. And I'm not going to put anybody in danger. Whatever uh, the <laughs> The profit on this would definitely not, um, you know, offset that kind of scariness. So yeah, we got some, yeah, anywho. So what happens when you, when I find a situation like this? Well, I got a box of parts, the box of parts, it's cleaned up, which have been cleaned up and then they get posted to offset the cost of the bike. So at the end of the day, I do usually make a wash on this. That's where I try to purchase these at the lower level, the price point just in case I come across something in this danger. That's another thing for me to refurbish for mountain bikes is a little more in the used market, buyer beware. Why? Well, you got things like this, yes. Second thing you need to consider is the suspension. Front shock and rear shocks, is that prior owner or owners have actually done any kind of pre, you know, service? I mean, they talk about a 50 hour, basically take it apart, clean it, put it back together. Talk, uh, 50 hours of riding, let's put that in perspective. If I go for a mountain bike ride once a week and I'm doing two to two and a half hours, math, math me up on this, you know, you're talking about maybe, you know, two months, three months worth of riding, which is pretty much everybody's window, so about, Three six to three to six months of riding, 
of having that suspension taken apart. Anything other than that is a complete overhaul. The seals and all that need to be replaced as well. And that becomes more expensive. You got the 50 hour, then you have the 100 hour plus tune-ups that they offer out there. Typically, they're gonna cost you around 300. If you're buying or looking to buy a used mountain bike, and if you don't know that person very well, <laughs> like, you know they're not gonna like fib to you or kind of just go around it. Even if it's a newer two, three year old bike, that suspension, it better it better been checked, inspected, that kind of thing. If you're buying used, yeah. I mean, I have one mountain bike that's full suspension. The cat never rode it. I know he didn't ride it. The seals and everything are just fine. That's why I feel comfortable selling that one. This guy, no, not even close. So when you're talking about used mountain bikes, that's a different perspective. I would highly recommend buying a used mountain bike from either like Rose Closet or a bike shop that's after to refurbished it. So if you do have any issues, you can actually take it back to them. Um, Plurus Cosa has a guarantee to it as well. They have techs that go through the suspension and so forth. Smaller guys like me, we do some suspension work, but not all. There's so many different seals and tools and all that over the spectrum over the last 20 years. It's virtually almost impossible. Also, the manufacturers only make seal kits and so forth, usually only about five years back. So then you got a shelf limit time. So mountain bikes, bike, Beware, you can get one and clean it up and might be fine and have a great experience, but there is some downsides to it that you do come across those situations. Suspension is definitely one of them. Also, what's a mountain bike? It's like an off-road vehicle. It's gonna be used very hard, dashed around, beat around, that kind of thing. Not like a road bike, not like a recreational hybrid, not even close to a gravel, even though they take more abuse not necessarily as much as this. So again, with mountain bikes, that's a little bit harder push. You gotta be really you know, mindful of what you're looking at and what you're willing to put into it. I would say, you know, if you're gonna buy a mountain bike and your budget was $1,000, look for that $500 bike because you're gonna probably put $500 into it easily, even if it looks great, uh, either between suspension, tires, what have you, upgrades the pieces that actually fit your body better, that's going to be an expensive lift. Mountain biking is fun. It's a great experience. I used to mountain bike race in the 90s, but it is an expensive sport. If you're just wanting to get into cycling and recreational riding, like bike paths and you know road and that kind of thing, that's a little bit less financial lift to get into. But mountain biking, yep, definitely more expensive. Well, this one's a bust. Well, on to the next. Thank you for hanging out with me. I'll have details in the comment or the I'll have details and description below on the various things and thank you for hanging out with me in the garage until next time if it's beautiful in your neck of the woods go for a ride Woo until next time in the garage